Uh, thank you. My name is Soren Yaden, and I will be talking to you today about JavaScript engines. Uh, and the main thing that prompted me to choose this topic was a question I've had since before I started learning programming, which was, how does all of this really work? And that was a question that persisted after I started learning programming because no matter if I learned this method or that method or what the behavior of a data structure was or like a framework, I was still wondering what really makes it all work. And I found that the answer to that question was JavaScript engines. So in my presentation, I'm going to go through what an engine is, uh, what types there are, what do they do and why we need them. And then I'll talk specifically about JavaScript engines, uh, their history, and what makes them unique. And then we'll talk in more detail about the V8 engine developed by Chrome and used by Node.js. So these are some typical engine components, uh, not just JavaScript engines, engines in general. Uh, so what a translator does is it's basically the name for the process that takes your source code uh, and transforms it eventually in a wide, uh, wide variety of ways down to a machine code binary that a virtual machine or a computer can execute. The two different types of translators are interpreters and compilers. Uh, what a compiler does is it takes your source code and then creates another file with the machine code binary and then the computer or virtual machine will, will execute that from a file system. Uh, whereas what an, an interpreter does is the same general process, but instead of executing it from a file system, it will sort of interact directly with the computer or the virtual machine. So there's no like uh, extra handoff between them, and that's basically the difference. Uh, so interpreters and compilers produce object code, which is in the form of a machine code binary, um, and that's based off an instruction set, which is kind of determined by the number of bits in your operating system uh, and a few other factors, but. The, the object code that a compiler produces is the binary that you know, your CPU or your virtual machine can actually run. Uh, and the instruction set is important because when that machine code is produced, it needs to be in a form that the virtual machine or CPU can actually understand. So usually what kicks off an engine's work is a lexical analysis. Uh, and that runs through your source code, like the code that we as programmers write. And it assigns, uh, it basically assigns tokens with, with values that your parser can understand. And the parser goes through that, creates an abstract syntax tree, which is a structured piece of data which can further be optimized and analyzed by your compilers, which will eventually produce uh, the machine code that's actually executed. So there, there are two main types of garbage collection, uh, and that's stop the world and incremental. The way that stop the world works is that uh, it basically, there's an execution phase, and then that finishes, and then the garbage collection works and sweeps out all of the objects in memory that no longer need to be stored. Whereas an incremental garbage collector works by having uh, short execution, uh, execution phases uh, within an overall execution phase, and then in between those smaller execution phases, you have garbage collection phases, which uh, sometimes allow execution to keep going, but usually stop it for a short time while the objects in memory are removed. So this is an example of one specific JavaScript engine. Uh, it's kind of just a simple graph of the, the steps in its process. I think SpiderMonkey was originally made by Netscape Navigator. Um, and I think it was the first JavaScript engine ever made. So it starts with, uh, with a parsing where it creates the structured data, which your compiler recognizes. Uh, and then there are two phases. There's compile and optimize, and then re-optimize. And the main difference between that is that some of your code uh, that needs to be compiled can sort of be compiled quickly and upfront, and that's sort of like run once code versus code that needs to be optimized more, which is considered hot code. Uh, and then after that stage is done, it runs into execution. And then I think this is an example of a stop the world garbage collector. So the execution phase clearly finishes and lets garbage collection occur. So most JavaScript engines use just-in-time compilation or their interpreters, uh, which means they source the code and execute it directly. Um, and the just-in-time compilation is hybrid between compilation and interpretation. So 
it's basically a compiler that executes at runtime rather than doing something that Webpack, doing something like what Webpack does, which is, you know, we get to see, uh, we get to put our source code in and then build this other document which has the code it, it, you know, wants to spit out, and then that will be our compiled document. Even though Webpack is a transpiler, not a compiler, uh, because it doesn't really produce a lower level language, and that's an important part of what makes a compiler distinct, is it has to go from a higher level language like JavaScript and then eventually spit out a lower level language, which is typically machine code binary. So originally JavaScript was meant to be very small scripts, which could sort of minimally enhance web pages. Uh, but then heavier uses of frameworks uh, and then a heavier reliance on AJAX requests sort of made it a bigger deal, and that increased pressure to improve speed and efficiency as people started writing scripts that were larger and larger. These are some of the active JavaScript engines today. There's Rhino, which was written in Java, developed by Mozilla, uh, and SpiderMonkey, which was part of the example I just showed. Uh, the original JavaScript engine, it was originally made for Netscape Navigator, but now it's managed and maintained by Mozilla, and it powers the Firefox browser. Uh, Chakra, which was developed by Microsoft and used in Internet Explorer and Microsoft Edge, and JavaScript Core which has been marketed as Nitro, so if you see that, it's the same thing. Uh, and that was made by Apple for Safari. Yeah, the Google V8 was created by Google's Danish uh, division uh, as part of the Chromium project. Uh, and like I said earlier, it's used by the Chrome web browser as well as Node.js, and it's written in C++. So these are some of the main components of the V8. It's currently in a development stage right now. So they're trying to wean themselves off of the previous process and make it more efficient and use less memory. As you've all probably noticed, Chrome uses a gigantic amount of memory. Uh, if your computer or your phone is a few years old, it's pretty much the only thing you can do at a time. Um, so in the previous versions of V8, uh, it uses two compilers, the full cogen and the crankshaft. They run in sequence, and the full code gen takes your source code, and it runs a very quick, uh, it runs very quickly and produces unoptimized code. And usually the, uh, the run once code, not the hot code, is gone through the full code gen, and that doesn't need any further optimization. Whereas what the crankshaft does is it takes the hot code that needs, that requires further optimization, and it uses the code sped out by the full code gen as a target to make sure some of the logical structure uh, the logical structure from the source code spit out by the full code gen is maintained through its further optimization. So the memory allocation and the garbage collection go sort of hand in hand. Uh, the way that V8 stores memory is it has two spaces. There's one space where new objects are inserted to memory, and then there's another which, um, which stores old objects, and then every time there's a garbage collection cycle, they're sort of promoted and moved into a higher tier. Uh, V8's garbage collector is considered one of the reasons why V8 is the fastest and most efficient. Uh, I think, and that's just because uh, of the way it selects the tiers, um, the tiers of objects that have survived uh, previous garbage collection cycles. It just selects tiers that are, um, you know, sort of the minimal that it needs to efficiently move on and run its collection without spending time on things that don't need to be removed or, you know, accidentally going over objects that it knows already don't need to be removed from memory. So the two new additions to V8 are the turbofan um, and then the ignition interpreter, which is kind of the overall name for the new process that they're creating. And this is kind of a, this is a graph of, or a chart of where they are right now. So they take the source code that you've written and then it's parsed into an abstract syntax tree. Um, and then it's generated into bytecode. And at, at the current state, the crankshaft and the full code generator, they can't deal with the bytecode. Um, because what the bytecode is doing, what bytecode is, is a compressed form of the, the source code. Uh, so it can be stored, it, it can be stored at like a much smaller size. And then when the turbo fan interprets the bytecode that it's given, it doesn't have to reparse anything because it's sort of stored in turbo fan. Um, Whereas the previous, the full code gen and the crankshaft compilers, which is what it was initially released with, they, they take a long time and they don't process bytecode. Uh, 
Um, and the bytecode lets us minimize the initial startup time because all the code that's not hot, the run once code, uh, can just be, um, can just run from a very compressed size and then execute it. And then just to finish it off, this is their goal. So as you can see, the full code gen in the crankshaft has been removed completely. Uh, and in replace of that, it has the byte code and then the turbo fan, which takes in the byte code and creates the machine code to be executed. Thank mm -hmm. you.